a monthly year-long lecture series called Ralph Newsom Lecture Series. It's funded in part by the Kikku Reforestation Fund, also known as the Newsom Grant, and also the Friends of the KBR do help with refreshments out in the lobby. Um, tonight we have Stanley Temple here. He is a senior fellow and a science advisor at the, Leopold, the Aldo Leopold Foundation, and is here to talk to us about um, passenger pigeons and some of the lessons we can learn from that um, historical event, and also some of the issues we're dealing with now as far as um, extinction and uh, our interaction with animals, with wildlife, and sustainable resources. So I'll hand it over to, to Stanley, and um, please do sign in when I pass this around. Thank you. Great, well thank you very much. And some of you may know that I spent my entire career working to save endangered species. So why in the world did I spend virtually all of 2014 traveling around the country talking about a bird that's been extinct for 100 years? Well, the passenger pigeon's extinction is clearly the iconic extinction event of North America. And as we realized that the 100th anniversary of that extinction was coming on, a group of us around the country decided that this was actually the classic teachable moment about extinction. And we decided to try to do what we could to commemorate the extinction by trying to do two things. Tell people about the passenger pigeon story because 100 years after the fact, most people don't know the story and also to use it as a, a lesson uh, about things that are happening today that are frighteningly similar to what happened to the passenger pigeon. So this is the passenger pigeon. It is a spectacular bird, not so much for its physical appearance, I suppose you could say it's subtly beautiful, but it was a spectacular species because everything that this bird did was done in almost unimaginable numbers. It was, at the start of the 19th century, the most abundant bird in North America, and arguably the most abundant bird in the world. There were three to five billion passenger pigeons in the eastern half of North America. And that's a big number, unless you're dealing with Washington budgets, but Three to five billion is unlike any other species that we have with us today. It meant at that time, one bird in every four in North America was a passenger pigeon. And if you put all those pigeons beak to tail and strung them out in a line, they could circle the earth at the equator 24 times. It's a lot of pigeons. <laughs> uh, so this was a very spectacular a bird. A bird, though, that we've largely forgotten about. And indeed, most people today fail to make the distinction between passenger pigeon, homing pigeon, carrier pigeon, messenger pigeon. Somehow it's all jumbled up in a lot of people's minds. And to sort of illustrate that fact, last year, one of the first lectures that I gave was at the Schlitz Audubon Center over north of Milwaukee. And before the lecture, an elderly woman showed up with a shoebox. And she said, Professor Temple, I hate to break the bad news to you, but the passenger pigeon didn't go extinct 100 years ago because I have the proof right here. Mm -hmm. This passenger pigeon died in my grandfather's barn in 1924. And we can prove it because it has a dated band on its legs. So of course, when she opened the box, it was just a homing pigeon. So when I broke the bad news to her, and we looked at the band and saw that it was from the Cream City Racing Club in Milwaukee, which is still an active racing club. So I said, I'll bet you if you, these, these folks are obsessive about keeping track of records, I'll bet you if you give them the band number, they can tell you something of the history of this bird. And sure enough, it had been lost on a race between Green Bay and Milwaukee. Um, the woman was mortified. She said, everyone in my family has been telling this story to anyone who will listen for 90 years. <laughs> but in any event, the real passenger pigeon uh, is extinct. And because it went extinct, really before we had modern ornithologists uh, studying the birds of North America, much of what we know about this bird has to be sort of reconstructed from eyewitness accounts. And 
this fellow, A.W. Bill Shorter, a Wisconsinite, lived in Madison, friend and colleague of Aldo Leopold's, um, was the person who literally wrote the book about the passenger pigeon. He was a wealthy businessman, retired in middle age, and spent the second half of his life devoted to his passion, which was digging through archives and libraries and museums, digging out eyewitness accounts of wildlife species in early America. And if that was his passion, his obsession was the passenger pigeon. <clears throat> he literally spent several decades traveling around the country, ferreting out all of these eyewitness accounts. And to his credit, he found over 10,000 eyewitness accounts. They were in newspapers and journals and books. And he was able to integrate all of these scattered observations into the most complete story that had ever been put together about the passenger pigeon. And his book still stands to this day as the go-to reference on passenger pigeons. So what were some of the things that he found? Well, he found that records of passenger pigeons go all the way back to some of the earliest written accounts by the early explorers of North America. Cartier and Hudson and Champlain, all of these guys who explored the Atlantic coast in the 1500s, they weren't bird watchers to be sure, but when they saw these huge flocks of pigeons like nothing they had ever seen in Europe, they commented about it. But most of the records that gave us insights about the life of the passenger pigeon came from the 19th century. And just a couple here. This one from Alexander Wilson, who's, who's often regarded as the, the first American ornithologist in that he spent virtually his whole life studying birds. And he had this to say, and it, it's a, an observation that was often repeated, that when these huge flocks of birds would settle into an area of forest, they would break limbs, the weight of the birds would even topple uh, entire trees. And many people described the forest afterward looking like a tornado had passed through. Our own Aldo Leopold described the passenger pigeon as a biological storm. A huge ecological impact on the forests of the eastern U.S. Probably the most famous account comes from Audubon. He was traveling down the Ohio River in a riverboat in 1831 when they crossed paths with an enormous flock of passenger pigeons that darkened the sky for three days. It was probably close to two billion passenger pigeons that flew over him, a big portion of the world's population. And if you were here as I was uh, playing the Heinrich Symphony, uh, guess who was on the same boat with Audubon? Mm -hmm. Heinrich was on this boat and was a European immigrant who was just so awed by the sight of these pigeons that he composed the first full symphony ever written in the United States. So Audubon's account is richly detailed and most people sort of stop with the uh, the light being uh, obscured as if by an eclipse, and they sort of don't move on to the second part of his account about the dung. But if two billion passenger pigeons fly over you continuously for three days, there's pigeon poop to be contended with. And many people describe the passage of these huge flocks as leaving the ground looking as though there'd been a snowfall. <laughs> so to give you an idea of what Audubon and, and Heinrich saw that day, um, in 2014, we produced a documentary film that maybe some of you have seen on public television called Billions to None. And for one of the segments in the film, we tried to, as accurately as we could, recreate what Audubon and Heinrich must have witnessed. And the next little sequence is taken from the film. And although um, Audubon and Heinrich didn't have a musical accompaniment, it will give you an impact, you might say, of what they witnessed uh, on the Ohio River. <laughs> 
avian phenomenon that you could observe anywhere in the world uh, today. So in addition to sort of all these observations about the pigeon's behavior, one of the things that Bill Sharger was able to do really for the first time was plot out the full geographic range of the bird. And it is basically a bird of the eastern deciduous forest. It's spent its entire year living for the most part in the eastern forest. It would range into the northern forest in the height of summer and a little bit out into the prairies. But for most of the year, they lived in the deciduous forest. And during the year, they were nomadic in that they were all, almost constantly on the move. They never followed any predictable route. They wandered to some extent unpredictably um, around the forest. So they ranged within the, the blue range there. And really the only time during the year that they stayed still was during the month that they nested. And they nested in the red zone here across the sort of lower <coughs> lake states. And it might seem odd if these pigeons have the whole of the eastern forest that they could have nested in. Why did they pick that particular piece of it? Um, and it turns out that this corresponds pretty nicely with the Great Lakes snow belt. And passenger pigeons nested very early in the year, and they fed on the nuts and seeds that had been produced by forest trees the previous fall. Throughout most of the forest, that was accessible to all the other critters in the forest all winter. Uh, but in the snow belt, a lot of it got buried in snow and wasn't accessible. And it, of course, when it thawed out early in the spring, provided food for passenger pigeons. And of course, as you can see, Wisconsin features quite prominently as a place where they, uh, they nested. So Bill Shorter, as I said, spent decades collecting the information that he used to draw this map. And honestly, he could have just taken out a Rand McNally road atlas. Because if you look around the country, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of place names that are named after the pigeon. And indeed, until the late 19th century, we didn't call them passenger pigeons. They were simply the pigeon or the wild pigeon. So all of these places were presumably named when the early settlers in that location just happened to be witness to one of these enormous flocks of, of passenger pigeon. Some of them, of course, uh, are, are right here in Wisconsin. We've got pigeon localities uh, scattered uh, pretty much all over the state. So the passenger pigeon, as this painting correctly depicts them, uh, was a bird that was part of the forest ecosystem. And they were tied to the forest ecosystem primarily because their principal food was the product of forest trees. So here they are in, a, in an oak forest and a tree with acorns. And indeed, it was acorns and beech nuts, oak trees and beech trees, that provided the bulk of the passenger pigeon's food. They fed on lots of other things, including agricultural crops, but this was clearly what kept them going. And it was also the explanation of why they were nomadic. Oaks and beech are what we call masting species. They don't produce abundant crops of nuts every year. They do it somewhat sporadically and to some extent unpredictably. So it's very hard from year to year to predict when and where around the eastern forest there's going to be one of these super crops of acorns or beech nuts, which is why the passenger pigeons wandered. They were constantly looking for those places where there was an abundance of food, a super abundance, really, uh, of food. And acorns and beech nuts were, were basically the fuel that kept uh, these birds going. So I said the only time they stayed still was during the month that they nested. And they would, again, wander around until they found the place where there had been a big mass crop the previous fall. They would settle in very quickly, build a really simple nest, and lay a single egg. And they, of course, like everything else, they nested in huge colonies. The colonies sometimes numbered in the hundreds of millions of birds that would cover literally hundreds of square miles of forest. 
And uh, because they did the nesting in such a huge number, uh, they could deplete essentially all of the food that was available around the nesting area. And following a, a sort of a, of a breeding strategy that a number of pigeons use, they would actually fatten up their young squab early in the nestling period until it was obesely fat. And then they would pretty much abandon it to finish growing on the accumulated fat, which fit with the fact that they had a very ephemeral food supply that was going to be exhausted very quickly. So you gobble it up quickly and, and stuff the little squab uh, until it becomes obese. Well, this was essentially a strategy that was enormously successful for the passenger pigeon. Obviously, they were the most abundant bird on the planet. So this lifestyle really worked in the eastern uh, forests, or at least it did until we came along. People had always hunted passenger pigeons. Native Americans hunted them, early settlers hunted them. But because of the unpredictable nature of the passenger pigeon's nomadic wandering, people really couldn't be very efficient at hunting them. You'd wake up one morning and there'd be a big flock of passenger pigeons in the sky and you would have pigeon pie for a couple of days and they were gone. But by the mid-19th century, all of that changed. We became deadly efficient at killing passenger pigeons. Passenger pigeons, to some extent, became a commodity. An entire business, an entire industry developed around killing passenger pigeons and selling them at market as a cheap source of food. And during this period, essentially every year, every time the passenger pigeons tried to nest, every one of these nesting attempts was found by the commercial market hunters and the birds were slaughtered in, in almost unimaginable numbers. And because the disturbance was so great, they often abandoned their nest or just failed to raise any young. And you really don't have to be a biologist to understand if you're killing these birds on an epic scale and you're preventing them from reproducing, extinction is literally just a matter of time. So we became so efficient at killing passenger pigeons that we were able to follow them wherever they went. So the killing eventually continued essentially year round. The pigeons' lifestyle that had been so successful uh, suddenly failed uh, uh, in the face of a, of a modern predator like, like human beings. So why were we killing these birds? Well, it was for this, market hunting. In the 19th century, we had no conservation laws. There were no restrictions on killing wildlife to speak of. And passenger pigeons, because they were so abundant, because they were easy to kill in large numbers, and because they were cheap, they became a principal commodity uh, in the markets around the country. After the Civil War, cities were growing, these urban populations wanted cheap food, and certainly passenger pigeons fit the bill. Um, they could be had in abundance, and they were very inexpensive. This is a scene from a Chicago market, and if you look closely, you can see just about every Midwestern animal that could be turned into something to eat uh, is for sale there. Essentially, any bird or mammal that could be sold uh, was commercially harvested. The pigeoners, as they called themselves, uh, eventually became quite a numerous uh, uh, profession. The U.S. Census figures from the time suggest that there may have been over 10,000 professional pigeon hunters. They were scattered around the eastern U.S., of course, and initially they weren't able to really be very efficient at killing pigeons. They were sort of restricted to killing pigeons when they came through their local area. So very much like Native Americans and early settlers, the pigeons would pass, they would take what they could, uh, and the pigeons would be gone. But during the second half of the 19th century, two technological advances made the pigeoners' job much easier, and they became sort of super efficient. First was the telegraph system. 
the telegraph system allowed these pigeon errors to overcome the unpredictable wanderings of the pigeons. Wherever the pigeons were, the word would go out to all of these pigeon errors across the eastern U.S. And instead of having a couple of local pigeon errors shooting at the flocks, now you had 10,000 pigeon errors from all over the eastern U.S. essentially following these flocks wherever they went. The second was the expansion of the rail system. This allowed the pigeon errors to kill the birds in epic numbers and quickly transport them to the large cities. And you'll note, somewhat perversely, that the big expansion of the rail system corresponded almost perfectly with the passenger pigeon's nesting range. So it meant that now there was an easy way to exploit pigeon nesting colonies, essentially wherever they occurred, get them on the train, and within a day or two, the pigeons could be for sale in essentially any city in the United States. So literally, this is what happened. Once the colony was located and the pigeoners started killing the birds, they would be plucked and gutted and packed 300 birds to a barrel. And trains, entire trains would be chartered essentially to go to the colonies and load up with passenger pigeons and take them back to the big cities. Some of these trains had a <laughs> thousand barrels of passenger pigeons in one ship. That's 300,000 dead pigeons on their way uh, to market. Well, right in the midst of all of this, um, in 1871, Wisconsin hosted the largest nesting colony of pigeons ever recorded. And you were essentially part of it. Uh, it ran from Black River Falls down to what today is Wisconsin Dells up to Wisconsin Rapids. It covered about 850 square miles, and that was just the main core of the colony. The birds nested outside of that area as well. Hundreds of millions of pigeons packed into this area, and all of the accounts agree that there were literally pigeons nesting in every tree. So you can imagine what a scene this must have been. And of course, because this was right at the peak of the pigeon uh, commercial hunting, thousands of people descended on this colony and killed the birds. Um, it was really quite a scene which Bill Shorger was able to document by looking at newspapers in Wisconsin that pretty much described what was going on. And here are just a few little extracts from some of the newspaper accounts that he, uh, that he found where people were shipping them out, you know, literally by the hundreds and thousands of, of barrels. Uh, he estimated that perhaps as many as 100,000 people participated in the killing. That would have been a couple of tens of thousands of commercial hunters, local people from Wisconsin who kind of joined in to get their share, and by this time, people from the big cities who would ride the train up to the colony just to have a few days of uh, killing pigeons before they hopped on the train and, and went back home. Um, as I said, it was just a merciless uh, slaughter. The worst, really, and it was a major turning point, actually, in the passenger pigeons' population. And as I said, that wasn't enough. The pigeoners were able to follow the birds wherever they went, and while they were on the move, uh, the pigeoners could kill them, but of course, in smaller numbers, so that they were again sort of restricted to selling them to the local market. But the pigeoners pretty quickly figured out that they could make a lot more money by trapping the pigeons alive and selling them alive. And the reason they did that was to provide uh, targets for a popular 19th century sport. The pigeoners, this is a photo actually of, uh, of a couple of pigeoners. We know they were pigeon trappers. Here in the circle is a wicker basket and perched on the handle are two passenger pigeons. Those were their lure birds. They would 
erect these enormous nets in the forest in an area that they anticipated the pigeons were going to be searching for food, they would put these lure pigeons in the center of the net, and whenever the wild pigeons came near, they would manipulate these, uh, these tethered pigeons to, to draw the wild pigeons in. And in the pigeoners' vocabulary, those were called stool pigeons. And of course, we've incorporated that term into our vocabulary today to mean someone who deceives their, their companions. So the reason they were able to capture the birds by the thousands and sell them was for pigeon shoots. Pigeon shoots were a very popular community event. Um, whenever pigeons were in the vicinity, the pigeon trappers, the pigeoners, would capture the birds and sell them to the town for a weekend of shooting pigeons. And literally, thousands of pigeons would essentially be tossed into the air for people to shoot at, target practice, essentially. And uh, although today we still have target practice, today, of course, we shoot at clay pigeons, which is a direct sort of legacy of the time when we shot at the real thing. So the pigeons were essentially under assault um, year-round, wherever they went. The last big nesting was in, in Michigan. After that, all the nesting colonies were much smaller in size. And, and when the colonies got smaller in size, it meant that the pigeoners were able to kill an even larger proportion percentage of the birds that were there. When you had 100 million birds and only 30 days to kill them, you could only you couldn't get all of them. But if you only had a few thousand birds in 30 days, you could kill them all. So this was basically getting toward the end of the line for the passenger pigeon. And amazingly, we did virtually nothing to stop this. Um, there were no serious efforts to stop it. We were still sort of of that frontier mindset that the natural resources of North America were limitless. I mean, who could imagine that the most abundant bird on the continent could ever be affected uh, by, by us? So really nothing meaningful was done. There were a few state level laws that mentioned passenger pigeon, but the majority of them were actually laws that were designed to protect the interests of in-state pigeoners from out-of-state pigeoners coming in to take advantage of our pigeons. So they were designed to essentially protect the economic interests of the pigeoners, uh, not the pigeons. So this is a, a sort of a hypothetical reconstruction, because we don't actually have specific numbers, but it sort of illustrates what happened. You went from three to five billion birds in the early 19th century, and essentially they crashed in the span of a human lifetime in what has to be one of the most dramatic demises of, of any species on, on the planet. And although we don't have specific numbers to sort of plot on a graph like this, Bill Shorter was so meticulous in collecting information that he did find the locations and to some extent the size of essentially all of the nesting colonies that occurred in the second half of the 19th century. And the next slide is an animation that shows you the locations and the size of the passenger pigeon nesting colonies during that final demise. And you'll see several things. It'll be very obvious to you how unpredictable it was from year to year where the pigeons nested. They're all over the map, so to speak. You'll also note how important Wisconsin is, that they were in Wisconsin almost every year. And you'll also note that as time goes on, there are fewer and fewer colonies, and the colonies get smaller <coughs> um, and smaller. So here you go, 50 years in a minute. The big symbols are colonies that were probably over 100 million, smaller ones, uh, probably under a million or so in size. Couldn't get a more graphic illustration of how unpredictable they were. 
getting down close to the end now, and there really aren't going to be any really huge nestings from this point. In fact, some of these nestings are literally a few a few hundred birds. Um, and as you get down to the, the bitter end, uh, by 1900, uh, there are no more nesting colonies. They are, they're all gone. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude of the crash. But Bill Sharper's records also reveal that people understood that something was going on with the pigeons. And because Bill Sharper was so diligent, I have been able to find eyewitness accounts from essentially every place that I have given one of these passenger pigeon lectures, including Vernon County. So here are a few of the eyewitness accounts of passenger pigeons in, in your county. It starts in 1864, uh, talking about millions of uh, multitudes were captured, the woods are alive, the nesting extends for many miles. That's 1871, the, the year of the big pigeon nesting. Uh, Pigeons abound, hunter's paradise, 696 killed in one afternoon at a, at a pigeon shoot. Um, over a thousand obtained for a big pigeon shoot. Um, still plenty of pigeons in 1882, but by 1890, the last account for Vernon County, pigeons not in usual abundance. So pretty much you can read into people's accounts that they were aware that something was unusual about the pigeons. But at the time, the easy explanation came from people's experience with these birds, that they weren't always going to show up every year, that there might be years in which no passenger pigeons came through your area. So the easy explanation was not that the pigeons were declining drastically, the easy explanation was they're just somewhere else. And the somewhere else, sometimes people's ideas bordered on the fantastical. Henry Ford, the Henry Ford, wrote an opinion piece um, in which he decided that the pigeons had all drowned out over the Pacific Ocean trying to fly to Japan. <laughs> Where you would come up with that explanation uh, is beyond me. But people were literally in denial about what was actually happening. And I actually had um, an example of this in, in, in my own family. My, my wife's family had been in Wisconsin since the mid-19th century. And back in 1902, her great-grandmother had contributed a recipe to a little cookbook uh, that was published by a, a, a women's group in Madison. So a couple of years ago, Jane wanted to reproduce her great-grandmother's biscuit recipe for a family Thanksgiving dinner. So she found this old book and was kind of thumbing through it. And there was a gasp from the living room. She said, oh my gosh, here in 1902 is a recipe for potted passenger pigeon mm -hmm. with a little footnote. They're getting hard to come by these days. Well, no kidding. 1902 was the year that the very last wild passenger pigeon was shot. There were no more passenger pigeons in the wild. The last few years, the passenger pigeons were so few in the wild uh, that they were no longer really hunted commercially for food. Instead, the last few birds were shot primarily by museums that wanted specimens for their collections. And the last bird was shot, the last wild bird was shot in, in Indiana in 1902. In the years that followed, there were several substantial rewards offered for any evidence of pigeons in the wild, and none of those rewards were uh, claimed. Finally, it boiled down to the very last bird the last survivor of a small group of birds that had been in captivity. The last bird, a bird named Martha, uh, died on September 1st, uh, 1914, at the Cincinnati Zoo. Uh, Martha, during those, the last decade of her life, she was literally a rock star. Uh, 
people literally came from all over the world to see her in her cage at the Cincinnati Zoo. People knew that she was the last survivor of this once superabundant uh, species. Uh, what most people don't know is that Martha was a badger. Uh, as we trace her life, which is not uh, completely recorded, but it seems most likely that she was born in 1888 and her original owner was an aviculturist in Milwaukee who had a flock of passenger pigeons. He had been quite successful actually at breeding them in captivity. They weren't, like most pigeons, that hard to breed. Um, eventually he passed his flock on to an aviculturist in Chicago. He didn't have much luck breeding them and he passed his sort of dwindling group of birds on to the Cincinnati Zoo where eventually the little flock dwindled down to Martha. Um, Martha, um, when she died, as I said, it was headlines around the world. She was frozen in a 300 pound block of ice and shipped off to the Smithsonian Institution uh, where I guess you could say she lies in state. Uh, she comes out of her vault on special occasions uh, for people to, uh, to see. But for us today, I think one of the most unbelievable things is that we did virtually nothing to stop this from happening. The birds bred in captivity. Today, if this was going on, there'd be a captive breeding program that could have rescued the birds. Today, of course, if the birds were declining like that, we'd have had conservation programs for them. But that wasn't possible. Uh, people at the time, you could say were ignorant, they didn't really understand what was going on, and there really was no national policy about conserving wildlife. But Martha's death and the extinction of the passenger pigeon was one of the principal catalysts for the emergence of the 20th century conservation movement. And all of the earliest policies and legislation dealing with wildlife conservation they all mention the passenger pigeon as the motivation. So the very first federal legislation that protected wildlife was the Lacey Act. And when John Lacey of Iowa introduced his bill into Congress, the first words out of his mouth is the wild pigeon. When Teddy Roosevelt by executive action started creating national wildlife refuges to protect the habitat for migratory birds. The first sentence in his executive order talks about the passenger pigeon. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 that eventually gave blanket protection to all migratory birds, again, specifically mentions the passenger pigeon as the justification of why we needed this legislation. So the passenger pigeon had a big impact on the nation. It essentially, its extinction was happening at the same time that the bison was going nearly extinct, that many plume-bearing birds were being killed for their feathers. But unlike these other species, the passenger pigeon had a bigger impact. Everybody knew about the passenger pigeon. Everyone alive at that time had probably eaten passenger pigeons. It was a commercial product. People knew about the birds, so it had an impact that the near extinction of other species that were being hunted toward extinction didn't, didn't have. So Wisconsin actually features pretty prominently in one of the important sort of aftermaths, you might say, of all of this. In 1947, the Wisconsin Society for Ornithology erected a monument to the passenger pigeon at Wyalusing State Park. How many of you have been to the park? So many of you have visited the monument. Uh, that monument actually is as simple as it is, dedicated to the last pigeon shot, of course, in Wisconsin in 1899. That monument was representative of something that had never happened in the world. It was the first monument ever erected to a species that human beings had caused to go extinct. So here we are just a few decades after Martha's death and we have 
essentially the community mourning the death of a, pass a passenger pitch, regretting what we had done to this bird. Many of you probably know Aldo Leopold's essay on the occasion of dedicating the monument. He was asked to pen an essay on a monument to the pigeon. And he really nails the significance of it here. For one species to mourn the death of another is a new thing under the sun. In the span of a few decades, our national mindset, our national culture had changed from viewing passenger pigeons as a commodity to now regretting what we had, had done. Essentially, the modern conservation period era had taken hold. Aldo Leopold, of course, is a master with words. There will always be pigeons in books and in museums, but these are effigies and images, <coughs> dead to all hardships and to all delights. They live forever by not living at all. And the passenger pigeon story, of course, will live on forever. It is a cautionary tale about what human beings are capable um, of, of doing. So this year, we rededicated the monument uh, in May of last, of last year um, at the annual meeting of the Wisconsin Society for, for Ornithology. Uh, thanks to the Bolt Company, who, who donated the services of their senior masons to uh, to fix up the monument, which had sort of fallen in disrepair. The DNR hadn't taken very good care of it over the years. Uh, I would have to uh, say that I think the monument probably looks even better than it did back in 1947. So the passenger pigeon is gone. It's never going to come back. Um, all we can do is essentially today is learn by the lesson. And the lesson, of course, of the passenger pigeon is most directly related to this dreadful capacity that human beings have for overkilling other species. Overkill means that you're killing a species faster than it can reproduce, which is a mathematical equation for extinction. And we have done this over and over and over again throughout human history. We killed off the mammoths. We killed off many, many species by simply not paying attention to what today we would call sustainable practices, not taking more than the animal is able to reproduce. And indeed, the passenger pigeon wasn't the only bird in the United States to go extinct because of overkill. We killed off the great auks of the North Atlantic, uh, very much like the passenger pigeon because they concentrated on a few islands during the nesting season. They were flightless birds, so they were easy to uh, kill. The Labrador duck. Labrador ducks presumably had life pretty undisturbed up in Labrador where there were very few people, but it had the unfortunate behavior of spending the winter in Long Island Sound, right next to New York, where there was a thriving market in waterfowl and the Labrador duck was killed to extinction. The Carolina parakeet. In this case, we didn't kill them because they were a commodity. We killed them because we regarded them as an agricultural pest. And finally, the last bird that we think is now extinct, the Eskimo curlew, uh, was overkilled to extinction sometime in the, in the mid-20th century. So there are plenty of examples of other animals, but the most dramatic examples of overkill, we don't call it overkill, we call it overfishing. And indeed, you don't have to go far to find examples of very valuable commercial fish that were overfished to extinction. Uh, the blue pike was once the most valuable commercial fisheries in the Great Lakes. And I, this is my, my mea culpa moment. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and Friday night fish fries in the 40s and 50s meant blue pike. Mm -hmm. I ate hundreds of the things, so mm -hmm. I contributed in some small way to their extinction. By the way, the date, 1983, has nothing to do with when they actually went extinct. That's when they officially declared them extinct. Even closer to home, Lake Michigan, uh, we had a number of species of cisco or whitefish that were, again, overfished um, to extinction. Well, 
you know, here we are. We're, we're in the 20th, 21st century. You'd think this would be something that was in our past. We can't claim ignorance about overkill any longer. We've got modern wildlife management. We've got modern fisheries biology to tell us about what are sustainable levels of take from these fish stocks or wildlife populations. And yet, we still don't seem to have learned our lesson. The next slide shows three examples of commercially valuable fish today that are frighteningly heading in exactly the same direction <coughs> as the passenger pigeon in the late 19th century. And uh, the music that accompanies it is what I like to think of as the anthem to overfishing or, or overkill. Back before the second war, we could catch our fish in shore. Boats were small and gear was rough. We caught fish but left enough. And now there's no more fish because the trawler fleets took all there was. We could see it coming then. No more fish, no fishermen. Shelley Posen is a Canadian, oh, in fact, he's the curator of the Canadian Folklore Museum. Uh, but back when this was happening, when the Grand Banks cod, the most abundant fisheries in the world, was literally collapsing. It turns out Shelley Posen and I were both graduate students, and we both by chance happened to be in Newfoundland when this was happening. I was studying birds, he was studying Canadian maritime music. Uh, we actually met at a campus bar near Memorial <laughs> University in St. John, Newfoundland, where he was singing for his supper. But the Atlantic Cod literally collapsed. And of course, here we are 40 years later, and it still has not recovered. Uh, today, the bluefin tuna is on everyone's watch list as a species that seems to be going the same direction. Some of you may remember a few years ago, a single Atlantic bluefin tuna sold at market for almost $2,000 for one fish. And um, uh, Carl Safina, a prominent marine conservationist, wrote an editorial in the New York Times in which he probably correctly predicted. He said, the fisherman who hauls the very last bluefin tuna out of the Atlantic Ocean will be a multimillionaire overnight. And he's probably true. We probably will fish this species uh, close to extinction, if not extinction, basically for sushi. Well, it's not all gloom and doom. The passenger pigeon did, as I said, catalyze the modern 20th century conservation movement, and as a result, we did prevent the extinction of a number of species that were being overkilled at the same time the passenger pigeon went extinct. These are the great comeback stories, the success stories of 20th century uh, conservation. These were all species that were very, very near extinction in 1900. They would have been labeled endangered if we'd had the turn way. Trumpeter swans were hunted for their meat and feathers. They very nearly went extinct, and of course now they've made a great comeback. Wood ducks would have been an endangered species in 1900. They were that rare. Now they're abundant enough that we can harvest them sustainably. Uh, Plumeberry birds, uh, sandhill cranes were essentially gone, uh, again, hunted out. Turkeys, like passenger pigeons, were a commodity. Uh, and now they're everywhere and so abundant that once again we can now harvest them sustainably. Several species of whales, like the Pacific great whale, have now recovered to almost pre-whaling era um, numbers. The American bison came back from literally a few hundred animals, most of which were at the Bronx Zoo in New York City, uh, to the point where we now have several hundred thousand of them. Beaver were just about trapped out for their fur. Now they're so abundant, they're often considered to be a nuisance. 
the Aleutian fur seals uh, of the Aleutian Islands were killed ruthlessly by Russian and American sealers. Uh, in one of the first international agreements, Russia and the U.S. agreed to stop killing fur seals in the Aleutians. And their numbers really bounced back spectacular. One of the real success stories of, of the 20th century. But in recent decades, their numbers are declining again. This time it's not because we're killing the fur seals, it's because we're overfishing the pollock, the fish on which they depend for their food. We're essentially this time not directly killing them, we're, we're starving them to death. So you can point to success stories like this, battles you might say that we've won, but at the same time you would have to conclude that we're losing the war. When you look at the numbers of species worldwide that are considered to be threatened with extinction, we're now up to double digit percentages of all the species of these major taxonomic groups of animals that are considered to be threatened with extinction. And indeed, most of this is not due to overkill any longer. Habitat destruction, pollution of the environment, other factors also play a role, but tragically, a portion of this is still due to overkill, something that we should have gotten over a long time ago. And you all know the species because they're sort of iconic species that we recognize are being pushed toward extinction, in this case by overkill that's driven by poaching. Some of you may have seen last August uh, the research that suggested that African elephants are going to be <coughs> extinct essentially by the middle of this century if we continue illegally killing them at the rate uh, that we are. A classic example of, of overkill. We're killing off rhinos for their horn, we're killing off tigers for their hearts, and the list goes on. Uh, you don't have to look very far to find species that are still being overkilled. Uh, inexcusable that this is happening in the 21st century. So we should be concerned about this and we should be concerned for two broad reasons. Some of these are completely selfish, the so-called anthropocentric justifications for why we should not be allowing this to happen. Many of the species that we are in the process of knocking off, like bluefin tuna, are incredibly valuable resources. It's just plain dumb to wipe out a resource that is so valuable instead of using it sustainably so that we can continue to benefit by using those species in a sustainable way as a natural resource. We also know through many tragic examples that regardless of how we cause a species to go extinct, it ends up often having consequences that are unpredictable. And sometimes those consequences come back to bite us. And in the case of the passenger pigeon, that bite is very real. Epidemiologists are now fairly certain that the mid and late 20th century epidemic of Lyme disease traces its origins back to the extinction of the passenger pigeon. As they've researched the organism that causes Lyme disease, they've discovered that it's not a new organism in North America. It's been here as long as they have specimens that they can find the DNA of this organism in. So it's not new in North America, so why did it suddenly explode in the 20th century? Well, the explanation is that when three to five billion passenger pigeons were wandering around the eastern forest, they were very efficient at gobbling up all of the seeds and fruits of the forest trees. And when they were doing that, it did not allow another group of animals, rodents, to explode in numbers whenever there was a heavy mass crop. You all probably live in or near the woods. You know what happens when our oak trees have a big mass crop. Deer mice, Chipmunks, squirrels, they literally do what rodents do best. They explode in numbers. They reproduce very quickly. They've discovered that those rodents, those small rodents, are the principal reservoir for the organism that causes Lyme disease. As those 
animals increased, ticks that feed on them increased. We ended up being an inadvertent uh, uh, sort of victim, you might say, in the life cycle. We don't, we, don't, we don't play a role in completing the organism's life cycle. We just sort of bear the awful consequences of it. So there's a case with the passenger pigeon, an unexpected consequence. There are also these sort of uh, altruistic reasons we should care. Aldo Leopold, you'll all remember, was the great champion of the ethics of our relationship with other species. And certainly, one of the most immoral, unethical things that human beings can do is to cause another species to go extinct. We also know, of course, that when we lose a species, often it has ripple effects throughout the ecosystem uh, that that species was part of and often that can lead to other species going extinct. And again, using the case of the passenger pigeon, we have a number of endangered species today. And part of the reason that they are rare and going extinct has to do with the loss of the passenger pigeon. One of these is an insect called the American burying beetle. And as they've tried to figure out why the American burying beetle that feeds on, on small carcasses, of small animals, why it's declining very rapidly and going extinct. It finally made sense that American burying beetles basically had a heyday underneath these nesting colonies when there would literally be millions of pigeons dying in one spot, naturally, without even human beings being part of the equation. Uh, and burying beetles basically had a field day and could reproduce in numbers. Today, there are no large concentrations of dead small animals out there for burying beetles to complete their reproductive cycle. So there are all kinds of reasons why we shouldn't be allowing this to go on, and probably the most compelling is the explanation that it's just simply immoral for us to be doing this. So it shouldn't be happening again. And it shouldn't happen again because some forms of overkill, they simply shouldn't be happening. We shouldn't be killing off rhinos for their horn for aphrodisiac or elephants for ivory trinkets. It's just plain stupid that we're continuing to do this. It's illegal, of course. Um, in the 21st century, there's no excuse to overkill any species. We know how to harvest species sustainably if we decide we want to use them as a resource. We know how to do it without causing extinctions. Endangered species, of course, of which there are many, they need more protection, not less. And yet, every year since 1973, when the U.S. made a pledge through our Endangered Species Act that we were going to do everything possible to prevent species from going extinct in our country, Every year, special interest groups have lobbied Congress hard to weaken or repeal the Endangered Species Act because it's inconvenient. Because in protecting endangered species, we often put limitations on what these special interests can do. Right now, as we speak, there are four bills in Congress, two of which would outright repeal the Federal Endangered Species Act and two that would significantly weaken it. And given last fall's elections, one of those bills is probably going to make it to President Obama's desk. And really all that stands between our national policy, our national legislation that tries to prevent extinctions is probably going to be a presidential veto. Almost every species in the world is legally protected in some way, and yet we still manage to overkill them because we don't enforce the protections. Elephants, tigers, rhinos, they're all protected, and yet much for the same reason that we don't seem to be able to win the war on drugs, we don't seem to be able to win the war on poaching because the profits to be made by killing these animals is so great. So we need to step up our enforcement efforts. Well, we formed Project Passenger Pigeon to basically take advantage of 2014 to get the story out, to uh, tell the cautionary tale 
And we really tried to do this in literally as many different ways as we could. Um, we produce now an award-winning documentary film that's now shown on about three quarters of the public television stations around the country. Billions to None was shown on Wisconsin public television. There are a number of books that were written about passenger pigeons, most of them essentially popular versions of Bill Shorter's account. Uh, artists had a field day uh, doing various types of artwork depicting the passenger pigeon. These beautiful sculptures that are uh, part of what's called the Lost Bird Project. These are giant sculptures of extinct birds. Uh, in Cincinnati, not far from the Cincinnati Zoo, a huge, what is it, six-story side of a building, a huge mural. Uh, these pigeons are all sort of 10 to 20 feet long. Mm -hmm. uh, and this bird, depicting Martha, leading a flock of passenger pigeons out of the cage that she lived out her life in at the Cincinnati Zoo. You heard Heinrich's uh, symphony. Uh, we have origami passenger pigeons, if you're uh, into, uh, into origami. And I've got some up here on the front table. A lot of things were written about passenger pigeons. There are some magazines there that uh, sort of tell you the behind the scenes story of the passenger pigeon monument and, and Aldo Leopold's essay. But given that I'm from Wisconsin and wanted to try to reach as many Wisconsinites as I could with this story, uh, I decided to make my own unique contribution to getting the passenger pigeon story out. I convinced the Capitol <laughs> Brewery in Middleton, Wisconsin to, uh, to create passenger pigeon IPA. It was a huge success. <laughs> and. Uh, many people came to drink to the memory of, of a lost bird. So the year 2014 is obviously at an end, but you're here tonight. The passenger pigeon story has legs and presumably we'll be telling the story for a long time and none of us will be around, but 100 years from now, I'm sure we'll be uh, commemorating the 200th anniversary uh, with events like this. So thank you very much. Fire away. Question. Yeah. Um, because they were in such abundance, did they not have any other predators besides humans? Interesting. Yes, they did, of course. But remember that being in huge flocks or herds or schools is a defensive mechanism against predators. When a predator attacks one of these large groups, each individual animal in the group has a very reduced risk of being killed, as opposed to being in a small group where your risk goes up. It was a strategy that worked very well against natural predators, didn't work so well against, against people. So imagine during the nesting season, 100 million passenger pigeons suddenly come and settle in. And there's going to be maybe thousands of birds of prey, hawks and owls, which were their principal predator. So there are going to be thousands of hawks and owls, perhaps, in the area that the colony occupied. Well, in 30 days, those predators could only kill so many pigeons. And as a result, they didn't really make a dent. <clears throat> and when you reference 30 days, is that about how long they would stay? That's about how long they would stay. Yeah, the food was pretty much exhausted by then. And they have but these are strong flyers, so they could range out over a large area. But eventually, they would have cleaned up everything that had been produced the previous fall. And since they nested early in the season, there was no food being regenerated that they could feed on. Yeah. Was it possible to extract DNA from Martha? Yeah. Good, I knew somebody was gonna ask the question. <laughs> yeah, it's an entirely different lecture about de-extinction, which has become a buzzword in the last two years as modern biotechnology has at least made it seem possible that we might be able to do something that has not happened in 3.8 billion years of life on this planet, and that is bring a species back after it's gone extinct. For all that time, extinction's been forever. But in the case of the passenger pigeon, along with the woolly mammoth, these two animals have become the holy grail of the biotechnology crowd that wants to pull this off. 
not because they are the most promising candidates, but because they're iconic species. Because those are the species that if you succeed in bringing them back, you're going to be nominated for a Nobel Prize. So the biotech crowd has gone gung-ho. But in the case of the passenger pigeon and the woolly mammoth, if they succeed in what they're proposing to do, they would not bring back a mammoth or a passenger pigeon. They would be able to recover some DNA from museum specimens or frozen carcasses in, in the Siberian tundra. But the DNA is just in horrible, horrible shape. One geneticist said it would be like taking the New York City phone book and turning it into confetti. And then just for good measure doing the same thing with the Boston phone book and mixing it all up and giving you this pile of confetti and saying, here, read this. Well, it sounds impossible, but the technology is getting there to start putting the pieces together. And that isn't going to make cloning possible, but what it might allow is an extreme form of genetic engineering where you would take segments of passenger pigeon DNA and you would insert it into the DNA of the band-tail pigeon, which is the closest living relative. And what you would produce would not be a passenger pigeon. It would be some very weird, unpredictable combination of band-tail pigeon DNA and passenger pigeon DNA. And those of us who are somewhat skeptical, we started referring to it as a franken dove. It's going to be something unimaginable, a new life form, literally. Yeah. So kind of along that lines, if there were passenger pigeons, does the habitat exist for them too? Well, if the passenger pigeon had made it into the 20th century and we had prevented the extinction, um, the forest that they depended on reached their low point and have now been regenerated really rapidly. In fact, at the low point, the eastern deciduous forest, we had only cut down about 60% of it. So 40% of that vast forest remained. And today, it's more like 80% of the forest has regenerated. <clears throat> so there's plenty of forest. The trees that they depended on are still there. But you have to remember, this was a species that traveled around in huge flocks that were sort of hardwired to range around the landscape looking for locally rich patches of food, which today is agriculture. Mm -hmm. And indeed, in the 19th century, they were already considered to be a major pest. Pigeons, when they finish nesting in Wisconsin, they go out into Minnesota and Iowa and hit the wheat fields. And you can only imagine a farmer's <laughs> shock when he woke up one morning and millions of pigeons descended on his wheat field and it was literally gone in minutes, totally gone. Uh, so if you remember all the Leopold's essay on a monument to the pigeon, he actually alludes to the dilemma that we would have faced. He said, if the pigeoners hadn't finished them off, the farmers would have been obliged to in self-defense. We would have done probably to the passenger pigeon what we did to the Carolina parakeet. Mm -hmm. Yes? At the beginning you said they were worldwide. No, no, just in the eastern just U.S., the, but they were the most abundant bird okay. in the world. There's nothing, there's nothing today, there's nothing that's ever been documented that comes close to the numbers that they achieved. There are other abundant birds, to be sure, uh, but we think of today a big flock of red wing blackbirds or, or starlings. Boy, if you see 100,000 of them, it's, whoa, look at that, you know, or a big flock of geese. That's nothing compared to what the passenger pigeon numbers were like. Yes? Did they have a set uh, nesting period, or was it dependent upon food? No, they were pretty, uh, they were pretty reliable. That they, uh, they nested early in the year. They usually started nesting in April and were pretty much done by, by May. Yes? Um, I'm curious about which special interest groups are most interested in leaving the Endangered Species Act and then also what we can do. Well, the groups that lobby hard is the uh, timber industry because you remember the northern spotted owl. 
the efforts to protect the habitat for this bird, of course, was up against the powerful special interest of the timber industry. Uh, the agricultural community, especially the grazing uh, community out west. Today, we've got another spotted owl on our hands with the greater sage grouse that's about to be listed as an endangered species, essentially, because grazing practices, some of it on federal lands, is removing the sagebrush habitat. You've got just plain developers who want to drain a wetland or, or clear an area of habitat so they can do whatever it is they want to do. They all lobby really hard uh, to make whatever the obstacle is go away. And when you talked about de-extinction biotechnology, this is really worrying because it provides, you might say, the ultimate out for these special interests. Right now, when they come into conflict with an endangered species, you can predict, can't we just pay to have a captive breeding program for them? Can't we translocate them? Can't we move them from where they're in our way and move them somewhere else? And to that, you can start to add, can't we just pay to have a bit of DNA saved so that we can clone them at some point in the future? No, not a pretty prospect. Yeah, over here. What's the status of the California condor right now? Ah, well, it's a species that my students and I spent many, many years working on, developing all the techniques that were essentially applied to the California condor. They're doing great. Uh, They've increased from 18 at the low point. We're now up to, I think we're, we're probably going to be close to 200 pairs in the wild now. And of course, birds in captivity as well. They're now nesting in, in California, in Baja California, in Mexico, in Arizona, um, in Utah. So they've expanded their range into multiple locations. Um, they're still facing problems, and the biggest one is lead poisoning. They're scavengers. When they feed on a carcass of a deer or antelope that's been shot and not retrieved, they ingest that lead bullet, they're dead, essentially, of lead poisoning. They're exquisitely sensitive to it. And several of the states, especially uh, California and Arizona, have enacted laws to eventually phase out lead bullets for hunting and going with non-toxic alternatives, uh, primarily because of threats to birds like the California condor. But the condors are doing, are doing great considering where they were just 30 years ago. You said that there's a bill that could possibly make it to President Obama's desk. Yeah. Which bill would this be? I don't have the numbers in hand, but I will tell you that that one of our senators, you can imagine which one, is one of the co-sponsors. Yeah. Is this yeah. one having to do with sandhill cranes? No, that's a state. That's a state issue. No, the two bills that would get rid of the Endangered Species Act would essentially kill it at the federal level, and would make the management and conservation of endangered species a local issue. So it would be left up to the state or the local community to decide what to do about an endangered species, which, I mean, that's hopeless for right. all kinds of political and biological Without reasons. Without federal protections, the states are going to do whatever yeah. they want. And the other two would just, through sort of, I would say, sneaky language, change the Endangered Species Act so that it would be much less effective. If this, I take this really personally. In the late 1960s, when I was a graduate student, um, I got to be involved in the launch of a program that today we call the Congressional Science Fellows Program, where graduate students or, or recent graduates are given an opportunity to spend a semester in Congress working on some policy or legislation in their area of expertise. So back in 1969, I spent a semester in Congress working on what in 1973 became the Endangered Species Act. There are actually some words in there that I, I think are probably still my own. So I take it really seriously. And because I spent a semester in Congress, you know, I sort of know my way around. So whenever I'm in Washington, which is often, I always try to find time to go and speak to our congressional delegation about whatever the issue of the day might be. And I don't mean this to sound partisan, but last fall I plucked up my courage to go see Ron Johnson. And I mean, he did see me, which 
I thought was surprising that he just didn't pass me off to staffers. So he gave me a polite few minutes and finally interrupted and said, Professor Temple, I'm, I'm really sorry, but he said, I disagree with just about everything you've said. I think we should repeal the Endangered Species Act as quickly as we can. It's a, it's a job killer. It tramples on private property rights. It's interfering with economic development, the sort of buzzwords. He said, I think we should be selling off as much federal conservation land as we can and getting it into private hands so that it can be creating jobs and contributing to the economy. Um, I don't believe in climate change. I think it's just you university researchers trying to get your hands on federal research funds. And it was, it was pretty much, well, you know, thank you for your time. Um, but he's not alone, of course. Um, so there's a number of what we think of as our bedrock environmental laws that are, are going to be threatened, going to be challenged pretty seriously. I think that's a good place to stop, and I'd like to get another <laughs> round of applause. And if you want to resurrect the passenger pigeon, I suggest you do it with one of these and take one of the Aldo Leopold Foundation's magazines that talks about Aldo Leopold's essay in the monument. Wonderful. Thanks again for coming. Our next Driftless Dialogue will be May 13th. It'll be on bats and white nose syndrome research, recent research done. So, and I, I heard there's a live bat going to be there too. So, so May 13th. Thank you.